Hi, and welcome to part three of this first lecture in the program analysis course. What we'll do in this third part is to look at some of the um, foundations of this uh, course. So um, this is basically material that you've probably seen in some other course during your studies. So this is just to make sure that everybody's on the same page and we start um, from the same um, level when we talk about the more advanced topics. So here we look into um, grammars um, and then some representations of programs, for example, ASTs, abstract syntax trees, and CFGs, um, which means control flow graphs. So if you have seen all this material somewhere else, um, feel free to skip this part of the course. So this is just to make sure everybody is on the same page. Because this course is about program analysis, it is of course based on programming languages because you first need a language in which you can write a program so that you can then analyze it. So let's start by having a look at what these programming languages actually are. So a programming language or short PL can be so thought of um, three parts. One is the syntax, the other one are the semantics of the language, and then if it's a real language that you can actually use, there also needs to be an implementation. So what do these three parts really mean? So the syntax basically means the form of programs written in this language. So how do they look like? What kinds of characters can you put together in order to get a program written in this language? The semantics um, are about the meaning of programs written in this language. So the semantics of a programming language basically say what will happen if you execute a program um, written in that language. And then finally, there's the actual implementation, which is what you need to really execute these programs. Um, there are some languages that only exist basically on pen and paper. So they have a defined syntax and they have defined semantics, but are never implemented. This is mostly for research purposes, but in this lecture, we focus on languages that are implemented. So the implementation is an essential part of these uh, languages. Um, we look into each of these three parts um, in some way or another during the lecture. I'll start to say a little bit about the implementation and the syntax here. And then in the next lecture, we look into more detail on how to describe the semantics of languages. So let's start with the third of these two ingredients, um, namely the implementation, um, because this is probably what you are most familiar with um, when you're actually using programming languages. So there are basically three different ways how a language can be implemented, which um, are compilation, interpretation, and some hybrid form of these two. And let's have a start by look at how typically a typical compiler works, so how compilation usually works. So compilation means we have some source code of a program. And at the end, we would like to execute this program on some machine. So we need to have um, the same program in a machine language. So for example, the source code could be written in C and then the machine language could be x86 if you want to execute this on a machine that understands x86 instructions. And now to do this, a typical compiler consists of four steps. The first one is um, a lexical analysis or short Alexa. And what this lexical analysis does is to split the source code into so-called tokens, which you can think of as individual words in the programming language. And then the next part is a syntax analyzer. or also called a parser. And what this part of a compiler does is to take the tokens and organize them into a tree, which is then called the syntax tree. Then next we have a semantic analysis. which is basically checking that um, some semantic properties of this program hold. So for example, if you have a typed programming language like C, then it's type checking the program. And then after the semantic analysis and assuming that it has successfully um, passed, then the um, final part of, the, of this tool chain is a machine code generator. 
which is taking the program in some intermediate representation and then emits the instructions in the machine language so that at the end we have, for example, x86 instructions that can then be executed um, on the actual machine. Another way to implement a programming language, which is not based on compilation, and this should be b not c, is interpretation. So without going into much detail here, um, let me just say that this is easier in a way, but not as efficient as a typical compiler. So what happens here is that the code is passed, so the first two boxes in the compiler are more or less similar, but then um, there's no generation of machine code, but instead um, the interpreter will go through the past code um, one statement after the other and just um, execute it whenever it sees that statement. And then finally, there's some hybrid approaches that basically combine this idea of interpretation and compilation. For example, this is done for languages like Java or also JavaScript, where you have a virtual machine that is starting to interpret code so that you can start running the code very quickly, but at some point um, compiled some of the code, usually code that is executed very often, so that it is executed faster because the machine code is uh, special, specialized and optimized. So this is typically much faster than interpretation. So these hybrid implementations in virtual machines basically try to get the best of both compilation and interpretation. All right, so now after the implementation, let's have a look at um, another ingredient of a language, and that's the syntax of the language. And here we look at two ways to describe the syntax, and the first of them is based on a grammar. So essentially what a grammar is trying to answer is the question, which programs are syntactically correct? So which programs are actually part of the language? And to do this, a grammar consists of four parts, which you probably have already seen somewhere. So this is hopefully just a summary. Um, one of them is a set of terminals, which are um, yeah, the basic building blocks of the programming language. Then you have a set of non-terminals, which you can think of as helper symbols um, that describe how the terminals can be put together in order to get a legal program. Then you have um, a set of production rules or just productions, which describe how to derive um, terminals from non-terminals. And then you also have an initial symbol, which describes the starting point of um, deriving a correct program. And this is some um, non-terminal. To make this more concrete, let's have a look at a specific example. And this example will be a very simple toy language that describes arithmetic expressions. So arithmetic expressions, things like um, one plus two um, and so on, right? So in order to do this, we need some we need to define these four things, the terminals, the non-terminals, the productions, and the initial symbol. And let's start with the uh, terminals here. So this is a set um, of symbols that your programs, or in this case, your arithmetic expressions are composed of. And this will be all the digits from zero to nine, and also plus and minus, because we want to focus on these two operators in our expressions. Then we need to have this set of non-terminals. And in order to define arithmetic expressions, there's, there are many possible ways how we can do this. So this is just one possible grammar, of course. In, in this grammar, we'll have four non-terminals, one called exp for expression, one called num for number, one called op for operator, and then the last one, digit for digits. We also need to define um, the start symbol. So in our case, the start symbol will be um, the non-terminal called exp because we want to at the end be able to describe 
and expression, and this non-terminal um, represents expression. And then we have this set of productions, which are um, each um, a rule. So let's um, let's just put down these rules here. So there will be one rule that describes how an expression looks like. And this is basically saying that an expression can be a number or it can be an expression followed by an operator followed by another expression. Then we also need to say what an operator is. So we give another rule for that where we say an operator can either be plus or minus. We also need to define what a number is. So we say a number is either a single digit or it's a single digit followed by a number. And then finally, we need to say what a digit is. And here we use the remaining uh, terminals that we haven't used so far by saying a digit is either zero or one and so on until nine. And these four things, the terminals, the non-terminals, the productions, and the initial symbol um, are now um, describing how our language of arithmetic expressions looks like. So now to make sure you really understood this, let me just have a little quiz for you where I'm basically asking um, what of the following um, is really part of our language. Um, and I'm giving you four options here. So the first one is this. The second one will be this. The third one is this. And then finally, we also have this. And at this point, if you do not yet know the answer right away, maybe stop the video for a second so that you can think about it. And then I'll tell you the solution. So the um, first um, example is part of the language because you can derive um, this program or this arithmetic expression um, by starting at the start symbol and then using the production rules. The second is not part of the language. And the reason is that um, the parentheses are not really <coughs> in our set of terminals, so there's no way to get this um, string of characters um, from the language that we have, to have defined. Similarly, the third um, example is also not part of the language. It looks almost correct, just that we do not have an operator um, for multiplication. We just have defined operators plus and minus. And finally, the last one um, is an example of this arithmetic expression language because we say in the first production rule that an expression can just be a number and a number can be a sequence of digits. So this example is a legal arithmetic expression. So now a grammar is describing what programs are part of a language, but once um, the compiler or any kind of program analysis tool has determined that a program is actually a legal um, program in your language, then a common way to look at these um, um, programs still on a syntactic level are abstract syntax trees. And since we'll see them um, a couple of more times in this lecture, let's have a look at what they actually are. So abstract syntax trees are defined also through a grammar, but this grammar is um, called an abstract grammar because it basically um, describes what trees are part of this um, abstract syntax tree. So just to give you an example, and this happens to be um, an example again for our arithmetic expressions, we could have an abstract syntax tree that basically says, well, there are expressions. Expressions can either be um, a number or an operator um, that is applied to two expressions. And an operator can be plus or minus. So as you can see in this abstract grammar, the um, terminals that are used here correspond to the tokens of the language. 
And just to give you an example, let's say we have an arithmetic expression 3 plus 45, then in our little um, abstract grammar, we would get an abstract syntax tree that um, says there's an operator, namely plus, and this has two children, namely 3 and 45. And this tree actually can be described uh, or can be derived from the grammar that you see um, because um, the operator is the plus and then the two expressions each are a number, namely 3 and 45. We'll see more um, complex abstract syntax trees and also see how this works for um, a larger language in the next lecture. So now an abstract syntax tree looks mostly at the structure of the program, but it's not really reasoning about what happens if you execute this program. In the following, we look at two representations of programs that look at particular aspects of what happens when you execute this program. And the first one are control flow graphs. So a control flow graph is basically a model of the flow of control through the program. So what this means is that it basically models in what order the different parts, the different statements in the program are actually executed. And obviously this does not have to be the order in which these statements occur in the program because sometimes there may be branches or loops or jumps um, which make you go um, not just to what comes next, but to some other statement. So such a control flow graph, as any graph, um, consists of two things, a set of nodes and a set of edges. And here the nodes are so-called basic blocks. What are basic blocks? Well, basic blocks are a sequence of operations that are always executed together. So you can think of this as basically a sequence of statements or sequence of operations that do not have any branching instruction in between. So you know that they will always be executed one after the other. And then the edges in our control flow graph are describing possible transfers of control. So they are basically saying um, after this, that thing may happen next. To make this more concrete, let's have a look at two examples. And example number one will be um, a very simple piece of code in JavaScript. But again, this could be any language. I'm just picking one um, that many of you may already know. So here we have an if statement with some condition called C. And if this condition is true, then we are assigning 5 to the variable x. And otherwise, we are assigning 7 to the variable x. And then after one of these two things has happened, um, we are writing the value of x to the console. So now if you want to create a control flow graph for this program, you would um, start at the first instruction that is executed here, which is this if, where we are checking the condition. And this will be one of our nodes. And then the two basic blocks that could be executed next one is this assignment of 5 to x. So we'll have another node here and it's connected through an edge um, with the um, conditional. And then we also have this other basic block which consists of again one assignment, namely um, assigning 7 to x. And then no matter which of these is executed, at the end we'll reach this console lock statement which is then another node and the two edges because you can reach this from um, either of these two branches. Now in this example, we have a branch, but we do not yet have a loop. Um, loops make programs more interesting. So let's have at, uh, a look at a second example where we now do have a loop. And in this example, um, let's say we have a, a while loop. So we have this while with some condition C and then in the while loop, there are two things. One is that we are incrementing a variable X and then we are assigning the variable 
x to another variable y. And after this loop, let's say we have um, again a call of console.log where we are passing the variable x. Now in order for you to really see if you've understood this idea of a control flow graph, um, I'll ask you to stop the video at this point and try to draw um, the control flow graph yourself and only then resume the video to double check if you've really understood it. So let me show you this control flow graph then. So in this case, we again have one node for this um, check of the condition in the while loop. And then there are two possible outcomes of this check. One is that we go into the loop. One is that we do not go into the loop. Let's start with the simpler one where we skip the loop body. So we will then um, directly go to the console log statement. So we have this as another node connected through an edge. Or we could actually go into the loop, in which case we have these two um, statements in the loop. And because they are always executed together, they actually form a basic block. So they will be together in the same node in our graph. So we have a node that has both um, the x++ instruction and this assignment of x to y. And this forms a single basic block, which may be executed right after the check of the conditional. And now what happens when you're done with this uh, execution of the loop body? Well, the semantics of a while loop say that you then go back to the um, condition and check again if you should enter the loop body um, one more time. So we have this edge that goes back to the um, first node here. So now the control flow graph focuses on the order of um, operations or statements happening during the execution of the program. Another graph representation that looks at a different kind of flow in the program are so-called data dependency graphs. So what a data dependency graph is doing is to model the flow of data from so-called definitions to so-called users. So um, again, it's a graph. So a graph consists always of a set of nodes and a set of edges. But now these nodes and edges are of course defined differently from the control flow graph because now the nodes um, are operations and the edges are possible definition use relationships. And we'll see what this is in a second. So an edge in this graph, so an edge that goes from some node n1 to some node n2 means the following. It means that at node n2, some data is used that is defined at node n1. And an important word here is this word may, um, because uh, a data dependency graph typically um, shows you any possible uh, definition use relation. So if um, node two may use the data defined at node n1, but maybe it doesn't have to because there may be a branch, um, then we'll still have an edge because this may be a def use relation. All right, let's again have a look at two examples to make this more concrete. Um, example one again is a simple one. And then for example two, um, I'll ask you to think about this yourself. So in example one, we have um, just two statements, one that assigns five to X and then another one that assigns the result of X plus one to Y. So looking at the data dependency graph for this example, we will have two nodes, one that is um, representing this first operation in the first statement where um, we are actually defining some value, namely the value of x. 
And then we have another operation here, which is um, to take x, add one to it and write the result into y. And because um, the second operation is actually using the value of x defined in the first line, um, there is an edge between these two that says, hey, there is a diffuse relation between these two operations. As a second example, let's have at a look at a piece of code that is slightly more interesting um, because here we have a couple of more statements and also a branch. So here we start with an assignment to x followed by another assignment, but now to y. Then we have an if where we are checking if x is greater than or equal to one. And if this is the case, then x is assigned to y. And then at any case after that, we are assigning to another variable z. And what we do assign is the result of um, adding x and y. Um, again, I'll invite you to stop the video here to just draw this um, data flow graph um, on your own to double check um, if you've understand, uh, understood the idea. And then let me show you um, what the solution looks like. So here we'll have one uh, node for this assignment of three to x, another node for the other assignment um, that assigns five to y. And then there are a couple of places where these variables um, are used. So one of the places where x is used is this check whether um, x is greater than or equal to one. So there will be a diffuse relation between these two nodes. Then we have this assignment of x to y, which is also using x because in order to write the value of x into the variable y, you first need to read x. So you're using x and because x may be defined here, um, we have this diffuse, re diffuse relationship. And then there is finally this um, statement that adds x and y and writes the result into z. And this one may use um, different values of x. So there will be one edge um, from here. Oh, sorry. And it may use different values of y. So there are two um, edges, one from here and one from here, because depending on whether the if is actually executed, the uh, last statement will either read the y defined in line two or read the y defined in line four. So we will have um, these two edges to represent this in the data flow graph. All right, and after this very quick walk through some of the basics um, that we'll need in this program analysis course, um, we are already at the end. So I hope you now know um, what grammars are, what ASTs are, what control flow graphs are, and what data flow graphs are. Um, and maybe you've already known this before. So this is just to make sure um, we all um, know about this now. Um, and then in the next part of the um, lecture, we'll actually have a deeper look into the semantics of programming language languages and how they can be defined. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time.